Section One of Whirly Gigs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. The World and the Door. A favorite dodge to get your story read by the public is to assert that it is true, and then add that truth is stranger than fiction. I do not know if the yarn I am anxious for you to read is true, but the Spanish purser of the fruit steamer El Carreo swore to me by the shrine of Santa Guadalupe that he had the facts from the U.S. Vice Consul at La Paz, a person who could not possibly have been cognizant of half of them. As for the adage quoted above, I take pleasure in puncturing it by affirming that I read in a purely fictional story the other day the line, Be it so, said the policeman, nothing so strange has yet cropped out in truth. When H. Ferguson Hedges, millionaire, promoter, investor, and man about New York, turned his thoughts upon matters convivial, and word of it went down the line, bouncers took a precautionary turn at the Indian clubs. Waiters put ironstone china on his favorite tables. Cab drivers crowded close to the curbstones in front of all-night cafes, and careful cashiers in his regular haunts charged up a few bottles to his account by way of preface and introduction. As a money power, a one million heir is of small account in the city, where the man who cuts your slice of beef behind the free lunch counter rides to work in his own automobile. But Hedges spent his money as lavishly, loudly, and showily as though he were only a clerk squandering a week's wages. And after all, the bartender takes no interest in your reserve fund. He would rather look you up on his cash register than in Bradstreet. On the evening that the material allegation of facts begins, Hedges was bidding dull care be gone in the company of five or six good fellows, acquaintances and friends, who had gathered in his wake. Among them were two younger men, Ralph Merriman, a broker, and Wade, his friend. Two deep-sea cabmen were chartered. At Columbus Circle, they hove to long enough to revile the statue of the great navigator, unpatriotically rebuking him, for having voyaged in search of land instead of liquids. Midnight overtook the party marooned in the rear of a cheap café far uptown. Hedges was arrogant, overriding, and quarrelsome. He was burly and tough, iron-gray but vigorous, good for the rest of the night. There was a dispute about nothing that matters, and the five-fingered words were passed, the words that represent the glove cast into the lists. Merriman played the role of the verbal hotspur. Hedges rose quickly, seized his chair, swung it once, and smashed wildly down at Merriman's head. Merriman dodged, drew a small revolver, and shot Hedges in the chest. The leading roisterer stumbled, fell in a wry heap, and lay still. Wade, a commuter, had formed that habit of promptness. He juggled Merriman out of a side door, walked him to the corner, ran him a block, and caught a hansom. They rode five minutes and then got out at a dark corner and dismissed the cab. Across the street, the lights of a small saloon betrayed its hectic hospitality. "'Go in the back room of that saloon,' said Wade, and wait. I'll go find out what's doing and let you know. You may take two drinks while I'm gone. No more.' At ten minutes to one, Wade returned. "'Brace up, old chap,' he said. The ambulance got there just as I did. The doctor says he's dead. You may have one more drink. You let me run this thing for you. You've got to skip. I don't believe a chair is legally a deadly weapon. You've got to make tracks. That's all there is to it. Merriman complained of the cold querulously and asked for another drink. Did you notice what big veins he had on the back of his hands, he said? I never could stand. I never could. Take one more, said Wade, and then come on. I'll see you through. 
Wade kept his promise so well that at eleven o'clock the next morning, Merriman, with a new suitcase full of new clothes and hairbrushes, stepped quietly on board a little five-hundred-ton fruit steamer at an East River pier. The vessel had brought the season's first cargo of limes from Port Limon and was homeward bound. Merriman had his bank balance of twenty-eight hundred dollars in his pocket in large bills and brief instructions to pile up as much water as he could between himself and New York. There was no time for anything more. From Port Limon, Merriman worked down the coast by schooner and sloop to Colon, thence across the isthmus to Panama, where he caught a tramp bound for Callao and such intermediate ports as might tempt the discursive skipper from his course. It was at La Paz that Merriman decided to land. La Paz the Beautiful, a little harborless town smothered in a living green ribbon that banded the foot of a cloud-piercing mountain. Here the little steamer stopped to tread water while the captain's dory took him ashore that he might feel the pulse of the coconut market. Merriman went too, with his suitcase, and remained. Kalb, the vice consul, a Greco-Armenian citizen of the United States, born in Hessen, Darmstadt, and educated in Cincinnati ward primaries, considered all Americans his brothers and bankers. He attached himself to Merriman's elbow, introduced him to everyone in La Paz, who wore shoes, borrowed ten dollars, and went back to his hammock. There was a little wooden hotel in the edge of a banana grove, facing the sea, that catered to the tastes of the few foreigners that had dropped out of the world into the triste Peruvian town. At Calb's introductory, shake hands with, he had obediently exchanged manual salutations with a German doctor, a French, and two Italian merchants, and three or four Americans who were spoken of as gold men, rubber men, mahogany men, anything but men of living tissue. After dinner, Merriman sat in a corner of the broad front galleria, with Bibb, a Vermonter, interested in hydraulic mining, and smoked and drank scotch smoke. The moonlit sea, spreading infinitely before him, seemed to separate him beyond all apprehension from his old life. The horror tragedy in which he had played such a disastrous part now began, for the first time, since he stole on board the fruiter, a wretched fugitive, to lose its sharper outlines. Distance lent assuagement to his view. Bibb had opened the floodgate of a stream of long damned discourse, overjoyed to have captured an audience that had not suffered under a hundred repetitions of his views and theories. One year more, said Bibb, and I'll go back to God's country. Oh, I know it's pretty here, and you get Dulce Farniente handed to you in chunks, but this country wasn't made for a white man to live in. You've got to have to plug through snow now and then and see a game of baseball and wear a stiff collar and have a policeman cuss you. Still, La Paz is a good sort of a pipe-dreamy old hole, and Mrs. Conant is here. When any of us feels particularly like jumping into the sea, we rush around to her house and propose. It's nicer to be rejected by Mrs. Conant than it is to be drowned, and they say drowning is a delightful sensation. Many like her here? asked Merriman. Not anywhere, said Bibb, with a comfortable sigh. She's the only white woman in La Paz. The rest range from a dappled dun to the color of a B-flat piano key. She's been here a year, comes from, well, you know how a woman can talk, asks them to say string, and they'll say crow's foot or cat's cradle. Sometimes you would think she was from Oshkosh, and again from Jacksonville, Florida, and the next day from Cape Cod. Mystery, ventured Merriman. Well, she looks it, but her talk's translucent enough. But that's a woman. I suppose if the Sphinx were to begin talking, she'd merely say, Goodness me, more visitors coming for dinner, and nothing to eat but the sand which is here. You won't think about that when you meet her, Merriman. You'll propose to her, too. To make a hard story soft, Merriman did meet her and propose to her. He found her to be a woman in black, with hair the color of a bronze turkey's wings, 
and mysterious, remembering eyes that, well, that looked as if she might have been a trained nurse looking on when Eve was created. Her words and manners, though, were translucent, as Bibb had said. She spoke vaguely of friends in California and some of the lower parishes in Louisiana. The tropical climate and indolent life suited her. She had thought of buying an orange grove later on. La Paz, all in all, charmed her. Merriman's courtship of the Sphinx lasted three months. Although he did not know that he was courting her, he was using her as an antidote for remorse, until he found too late that he had acquired the habit. During that time he had received no news from home. Wade did not know where he was, and he was not sure of Wade's exact address, and was afraid to write. He thought he had better let manners rest as they were for a while. One afternoon he and Mrs. Conant hired two ponies and rode out along the mountain trail as far as the little cold river that came tumbling down the foothills. There they stopped for a drink, and Merriman spoke his piece. He proposed, as Bibb had prophesied. Mrs. Conant gave him one glance of brilliant tenderness, and then her face took on such a strange, haggard look that Merriman was shaken out of his intoxication and back to his senses. "'I beg your pardon, Florence,' he said, releasing her hand, "'but I'll have to hedge on part of what I said. "'I can't ask you to marry me, of course. "'I killed a man in New York, a man who was my friend, "'shot him down in quite a cowardly manner, I understand. "'Of course, the drinking didn't excuse it. "'Well, I couldn't resist having my say, and I'll always mean it. "'I'm here as a fugitive from justice.' and I suppose that ends our acquaintance. Mrs. Conant plucked little leaves assiduously from the low-hanging branch of a lime tree. I suppose so, she said, in low, oddly uneven tones. But that depends upon you. I'll be as honest as you were. I poisoned my husband. I am a self-made widow. A man cannot love a murderess, so I suppose that ends our acquaintance. She looked up at him slowly, his face turned a little pale, and he stared at her blankly, like a deaf and dumb man who was wondering what it was all about. She took a swift step toward him, with stiffened arms and eyes blazing. "'Don't look at me like that,' she cried, as though she were in acute pain. "'Curse me, or turn your back on me, but don't look that way. "'Am I a woman to be beaten? "'If I could show you, here on my arms and on my back are scars.' and it has been more than a year, scars that he made in his brutal rages. A holy nun would have risen and struck the fiend down. Yes, I killed him. The foul and horrible words that he hurled at me that last day are repeated in my ears every night when I sleep. And then came his blows, and the end of my endurance. I got the poison that afternoon. It was his custom to drink every night in the library, before going to bed, a hot punch made of rum and wine. Only from my fair hands would he receive it, because he knew the fumes of spirits always sickened me. That night, when the maid brought it to me, I sent her downstairs on an errand. Before taking him his drink, I went into my little private cabinet and poured into it more than a teaspoonful of tincture of aconite, enough to kill three men, so I had learned. I had drawn six thousand dollars that I had in bank, and with that and a few things in a satchel, I left the house without anyone seeing me. As I passed the library, I heard him stagger up and fall heavily on a couch. I took a night train for New Orleans, and from there I sailed to the Bermudas. I finally cast anchor in La Paz, and now what have you to say? Can you open your mouth? Merriman came back to life. Florence, he said earnestly, I want you. I don't care what you've done, if the world... Ralph, she interrupted, almost with a scream, be my world. Her eyes melted, she relaxed magnificently, and swayed toward Merriman so suddenly that he had to jump to catch her. Dear me, in such scenes, how the talk runs into artificial prose. But it can't be helped. It's a subconscious smell of the footlight smoke that's in all of us. Stir the depths of your cook's soul sufficiently, and she will discourse in Bulwer-Lightonese. 
Merriman and Miss Conant were very happy. He announced their engagement at the Hotel Oria del Mar. Eight foreigners and four native asters pounded his back and shouted insincere congratulations at him. Pedrito, the Castilian mannered barkeep, was goaded to extra duty until his agility would have turned a Boston cherry phosphate clerk a pale lilac with envy. They were both very happy. According to the strange mathematics of the gods of mutual affinity, the shadows that clouded their pasts when united became only half as dense instead of darker. They shut the world out and bolted the doors. Each was the other's world. Mrs. Conant lived again. The remembering look left her eyes. Merriman was with her every moment that was possible. On a little plateau under a grove of palms and calabash trees, they were going to build a fairy bungalow. They were to be married in two months. Many hours of the day they had their heads together over the house plans. Their joint capital would set up a business in fruit or woods that would yield a comfortable support. Good night, my world, would say Mrs. Conant every evening when Merriman left her for his hotel. They were very happy. Their love had, circumstantially, that element of melancholy in it that it seems to require to attain its supremest elevation. And it seemed their mutual great misfortune or sin was a bond that nothing could sever. One day a steamer hove into offing. Bare-legged and bare-shouldered, La Paz scampered down to the beach, for the arrival of a steamer was their loop-the-loop, -the -loop, circus emancipation day, and four o'clock tea. When the steamer was near enough, wise ones proclaimed that she was the Pajaro, bound up coast from Callejo to Panama. The Pajaro put on brakes a mile offshore. Soon a boat came bobbing shoreward. Merriman strolled down on the beach to look on. In the shallow water, the Carib sailors sprang out and dragged the boat with a mighty rush to the firm shingle. Out climbed the purser, the captain, and two passengers, plowing their way through the deep sand toward the hotel. Merriman glanced toward them with the mild interest due to strangers. There was something familiar to him in the walk of one of the passengers. He looked again, and his blood seemed to turn to strawberry ice cream in his veins. Burly, arrogant, debonair as ever, H. Ferguson Hedges, the man he had killed, was coming toward him ten feet away. When Hedges saw Merriman, his face flushed a dark red. Then he shouted in his old bluff way, Hello, Merriman, glad to see you. Didn't expect to find you out here. Quinby, this is my old friend Merriman of New York. Merriman, Mr. Quimby. Merriman gave Hedges and then Quinby an ice-cold hand. Burr, said Hedges, but you've got a frapped flipper. Man, you're not well. You're as yellow as a Chinaman. Malaria here? Steer us to the bar, if there is such a thing, and let us take a prophylactic. Merriman, still half comatose, led them toward the Hotel Oria del Mar. Quinby and I, explained Hedges, puffing through the slippery sand, are looking out along the coast for some investments. We've just come up from Concepcion and Valparaiso and Lima. The captain of the subsidized ferry boat told us there was some good pickings around here in silver mines. So we got off. Now, where's that cafe, Merriman? Oh, in this portable soda water pavilion? Leaving Quinby at the bar, Hedges drew Merriman aside. Now what does this mean, he said, with gruff kindness. Are you skulking about that foo row we had? I thought, stammered Merriman, I heard, they told me you were, that I had. Well, you didn't, and I'm not, said Hedges. That fool young ambulance surgeon told Wade I was a candidate for a coffin, just because I got tired and quit breathing. I laid up in a private hospital for a month, but here I am, kicking as hard as ever. Wade and I tried to find you, but couldn't. Now, Merriman, shake hands and forget it all. I was as much to blame as you were, and the shot really did me good. I came out of the hospital as healthy and fit as a cab horse. Come on, that drink's waiting. Old man, said Merriman brokenly, I don't know how to thank you. I, well, you know. Oh, forget it, boomed Hedges. 
Quinby'll die of thirst if we don't join him. Bibb was sitting on the shady side of the gallery, waiting for the eleven o'clock breakfast. Presently Merriman came out and joined him. His eye was strangely bright. Bib, my boy, he said slowly, waving his hand. Do you see those mountains and that sea and sky and sunshine? They're mine, Bibbs be all mine. You go in, said Bib, and take eight grains of quinine right away. It won't do in this climate for a man to get to thinking he's Rockefeller or James O'Neill either. Inside the purser was untying a great roll of newspapers, many of them weeks old, gathered in the lower ports by the Pajaro to be distributed at casual stopping places. Thus do the beneficent voyagers scatter news and entertainment among the prisoners of sea and mountains. Tio Pancho, the hotel proprietor, set his great silver-rimmed anteos upon his nose and divided the papers into a number of smaller rolls. A barefooted muchacho dashed in, desiring the post of messenger. Bienvenido, said Tio Pancho. This to Senora Conant, that to El Dr. Schlegel. Dios, what a name to say. That to Senor Davis, one for Don Alberto. These two for Casa de Hospedes, number six, and Lancali de las Buenas Gracias. And say to them all, muchacho, that the Pajaro sails for Panama at three this afternoon. If any have letters to send by post, let them come quickly, that they may first pass through the Carrero. Mrs. Conant received her roll of newspapers at four o'clock. The boy was late in delivering them, because he had been deflected from his duty by an iguana that crossed his path and to which he immediately gave chase. But it made no hardship, for she had no letters to send. She was idling in a hammock in the patio of the house that she occupied, half awake, happily dreaming of the paradise that she and Merriman had created out of the wrecks of their pasts. She was content now for the horizon of that shimmering sea to be the horizon of her life. They had shut out the world and closed the door. Merriman was coming to her house at seven. After his dinner at the hotel, she would put on a white dress and an apricot-colored lace mantilla, and they would walk an hour under the coconut palms by the lagoon. She smiled contentedly and chose a paper at random from the roll the boy had brought. At first the words of a certain headline of a Sunday newspaper meant nothing to her. They conveyed only a visualized sense of familiarity. The largest type ran thus, Lloyd B. Conant secures divorce, and then the subheadings, well-known St. Louis paint manufacturer wins suit, pleading one year's absence of wife. Her mysterious disappearance recalled. Nothing has been heard of her since. Twisting herself quickly out of the hammock, Mrs. Conant's eyes soon traversed the half-column of the recall. It ended thus. It will be remembered that Mrs. Conant disappeared one evening in March of last year. It was freely rumored that her marriage with Lloyd B. Conant resulted in much unhappiness. Stories were not wanting to the effect that his cruelty toward his wife had more than once taken the form of physical abuse. After her departure, a full bottle of tincture of aconite, a deadly poison, was found in a small medicine cabinet in her bedroom. This might have been an indication that she meditated suicide. It is supposed that she abandoned such an intention, if she possessed it, and left her home instead. Mrs. Conant slowly dropped the paper and sat on a chair, clasping her hands tightly. Let me think, oh God, let me think, she whispered. I took the bottle with me. I threw it out of the window of the train. I... There was another bottle in the cabinet. There were two, side by side, the aconite and the valerian that I took when I could not sleep. If they found the aconite, bottle full, why? But he is alive, of course. I gave him only a harmless dose of valerian. I am not a murderess, in fact. Ralph, I owe God, don't let this be a dream. She went into the part of the house that she rented from the old Peruvian man and his wife, shut the door, and walked up and down her room swiftly and feverishly for half an hour. Merriman's photograph stood in a frame on a table. 
She picked it up, looked at it with a smile of exquisite tenderness, and dropped four tears on it, and Merriman only twenty rods away. Then she stood still for ten minutes, looking into space. She looked into space through a slowly opening door. On her side of the door was the building material for a castle of romance, love, an arcade of waving palms, a lullaby of waves on the shore of a haven of rest, respite, peace, a lotus land of dreamy ease and security, a life of poetry and heart's ease and refuge. Romanticist, will you tell me what Mrs. Conant saw on the other side of the door? You cannot, that is, you will not. Very well, then, listen. She saw herself go into a department store and buy five spools of silk thread and three yards of gingham to make an apron for the cook. Shall I charge it, ma'am? asked the clerk. As she walked out, a lady whom she met greeted her cordially. Oh, where did you get the pattern for those sleeves, dear Mrs. Conant? she said. At the corner, a policeman helped her across the street and touched his helmet. Any caller, she asked the maid when she reached home. Mrs. Waldron answered the maid. And the two Mrs. Jenkins. Very well, she said. You may bring me a cup of tea, Maggie. Mrs. Conant went to the door and called Angela, the old Peruvian woman. If Mateo is there, send him to me. Mateo, a half-breed, shuffling and old but efficient, came. Is there a steamer or vessel of any kind leaving this coast tonight or tomorrow that I can get passage on, she asked. Mateo considered. At Punta Reña, thirty miles down the coast, senora, he answered, there is a small steamer loading with Sicona and dye woods. She sails for San Francisco tomorrow at sunrise. So says my brother, who arrived in his sloop today, passing by Punta Reña. You must take me in that sloop to the steamer tonight. Will you do that? Perhaps Mateo shrugged a suggestive shoulder. Mrs. Conant took a handful of money from a drawer and gave it to him. Get that sloop ready behind the little point of land below the town, she ordered. Get sailors and be ready to sail at six o'clock. In half an hour, bring a cart partly filled with straw into the patio here and take my trunk to the sloop. There is more money yet. Now hurry. For one time, Mateo walked away without shuffling his feet. Angela, cried Mrs. Conant almost fiercely, come and help me pack. I am going away, out with this trunk. My clothes first, stir yourself. Those dark dresses first, hurry. From the first she did not waver from her decision. Her view was clear and final. Her door had opened and let the world in. Her love for Merriman was not lessened, but it now appeared a hopeless and unrealizable thing. The visions of their future that had seemed so blissful and complete had vanished. She tried to assure herself that her renunciation was rather for his sake than for her own. Now that she was cleared of her burden, at least, technically, would not his own weigh too heavily upon him. If she should cling to him, would not the difference forever silently mar and corrode their happiness? Thus she reasoned, but there were a thousand little voices calling to her that she could feel rather than hear, like the hum of distant powerful machinery, the little voices of the world that, when raised in unison, can send their insistent call through the thickest door. Once while packing, a brief shadow of the lotus dream came back to her. She held Merriman's picture to her heart with one hand, while she threw a pair of shoes into the trunk with her other. At six o'clock, Mateo returned and reported the sloop ready. He and his brother had lifted the trunk into the cart, covered it with straw, and conveyed it to the point of embarkation. From there they transferred it on board in the sloop's dory. Then Mateo returned for additional orders. Mrs. Conant was ready. She had settled all business matters with Angela, who was impatiently waiting. She wore a long, loose black silk duster that she often walked about in when the evenings were chilly. On her head was a small round hat, and over it the apricot-colored lace mantilla. Dusk had quickly followed the short twilight. Mateo led her by dark and grass-grown streets toward the point behind which the sloop was anchored. On turning a corner, they beheld the Hotel Oria del Mar, 
three streets away, nebulously aglow with its array of kerosene lamps. Mrs. Conant paused, with streaming eyes. I must, I must see him once before I go, she murmured in anguish. But even then she did not falter in her decision. Quickly she invented a plan by which she might speak to him, and yet make her departure without his knowing. She would walk past the hotel, ask someone to call him out, and talk a few moments on some trivial excuse, leaving him expecting to see her at home at seven. She unpinned her hat and gave it to Matteo. Keep this and wait here till I come, she ordered. Then she draped the mantilla over her head, as she usually did, when walking after sunset, and went straight to the Aurea del Mar. She was glad to see the bulky, white-clad figure of Tio Pancho standing alone on the gallery. Tio Pancho, she said, with a charming smile, may I trouble you to ask Mr. Merriman to come out for just a few moments that I may speak with him? Tio Pancho bowed as an elephant bows. Buenas tardes, Senora Conant, he said, as a cavalier talks. And then he went on, less at his ease. But does not the Senora know that Senor Merriman sailed on the Pajaro for Panama at three o'clock this afternoon? End of section one.